Yeah, thanks for the invite. This is actually my first time in Vienna. I, I before I came here, I knew like two things. Uh, I knew there was this uh, some composer that was named after a dog or some otherwise. I mean, you know, this Beethoven. I watched this dog movie when I was a kid. And there was this uh, ice cream cake, Viennetta or something like that, and I like it a lot. So good on you. But uh, yeah, I actually I spent some time in the city, great city. So I have to spend more time time, time there. But uh, it's kind of Funny how I actually got here. Uh, three, time, three years ago, I made a comment on someone's blog, and it kind of pushed something forward. And uh, now I have like two books. And what what actually you see here is uh, like a summarized version of, of my newest book. So what actually happened is that I did this server JS thing. So there's tons of material about Webpack and React and interviews and all that. And this is the book. You can find it freely online. And there's also a paper version. And of course, because it's about 499 pages, because 500 would be too much. So I took this almost 500 page book and I summarized it into something you can kind of digest. So it's like the book, but the best parts. Uh, you can find the slides online later if you want to review. And uh, if you go to the slides, you can click on the slides and get to the book and learn more about the topics. The way I structured this is that the plan is to have like uh, 45 minutes on the first presentation. It has, and this has five parts. After each part, you can ask me questions and uh, we can discuss a little bit. And after the first presentation, we'll take a 10 minute break. So everyone can cool off a bit and get some, something to drink and so on. And after that break, uh, we will go to the second section. It can be something like 30 minutes and we'll do the same again, but more this time more advanced. So it's going to be a lot of topics, and a lot of these topics they actually go beyond Webpack. So it's like uh, Webpack is the tool I use to discuss separate techniques. So even if you don't use Webpack, you most likely learn something new, I hope. I will start by describing what is Webpack. So because the problem is that uh, for a lot of people, Webpack is like a black box. So if you go to Germany or Berlin, you're, you'll find these crossings and there's like orange box and then you try to push and pull and nothing happens so it, webpack is like the box if you don't understand why the box is there it doesn't make any sense so i will i will describe webpack a little bit first so you understand what's going on but then i discuss how to develop with webpack so uh, how to improve your development flow using webpack uh, then i discuss the topic of styling so how to deal with CSS and different styling files and Webpack specifics because there are certain issues you have to be aware of. I also discuss sorting assets, like how to deal with loaders, loader specific techniques, uh, fonts, images, and so on. And finally, I discuss uh, the topic of building because you most likely want some kind of uh, bundles out of it. So I'll discuss bundle splitting, code splitting, and, and so on. But maybe we should get started. So. What is Webpack? Uh, do we have any C coders? Does anyone remember C? Yeah, good, good. Because I mean, normally there's like one hand, so at least you have C coders in Vienna. So you remember, because in, in C we have this C code, and you cannot give C code to a computer and expect that it understands. So then you have to compile. There's this compilation step in between. We have the same situation in web. You have your web ap application, a lot of modules. But uh, at least yet, you cannot pass these models very easily to browser and expect it to understand this. So for that reason, we need transformation in between. So we take this application, and then we convert it into bundles, which we give to the browser, and then browser understands. So we have something that's, uh, that the developer understands and something that the browser understands. And th then the web pack is actually in between. So th it's, it's the compiler or the tool that performs this transformation. So based on that, I made this image so on the left side, we have the application. It can be thousand models or more. And it contains all assets. So you have JavaScript files and CSS files and images, fonts, whatever. And they can have references to each other and so on. And on the right side, we have the output. So we get, uh, we get bundles. So we get application bundle, and we can have split points. Split points are something that get uh, loaded later as, as we need them. So you might have a button. A uh, user clicks the button, and then we load the code. In between, we have Webpack. Webpack itself is a collection of plugins. It implements this life cycle, so it, it starts compiling and it, it provides compilation that that's actually contains whole dependency graph on the left. And inside all this, we have loaders. Loaders map to specific assets. So for instance, in this case, we capture JS files. So we test against JS, and then we apply Babel loader against each. 
we get, it's just a generic mechanism or a, a way to perform transformations. So loaders are more specific than plugins. Sometimes they use plugins and loaders together. Uh, extract text webpack plugin is example of that, but I'll discuss that later. But this is like the basic idea. So you take this application and convert it into bundles. And webpack is in the middle and it performs this transformation. So to, just to dig into this uh, concepts entry, it tells you where to start bundling. So in this case, we have app entry. I've named it as app, app and uh, it points to a file. And uh, it, it tells Webpack that you should start uh, your process there. So it, it starts going through the graph from that specific file. We also have output. So we tell Webpack that you should output in this directory. And here <coughs> we capture name using this placeholder. So it becomes app.js. We also have these loaders, so model rules. So we capture uh, the JS file, apply Babel loader, and uh, do some extra. So in this case, we exclude node modules because we don't want to apply Babel loader against node modules. So uh, yeah, the focus is on transformations. Plugins, this is like everything else. So minification and extraction, and you'll see a lot of plugins. So you get this little plugin list. And easily the most powerful way to extend Webpack. And you get access to pretty much everything it does in between. And if you dig into Webpack source, you'll find a, a huge collection of plugins. So these plugins, they point to each other and so on. It can be a little intimidating at first. We also have uh, this resolve field. So the point is that when you import, uh, then you can hack a bit. So let's say you have like import foo, and you want to point, we want that foo points to some file elsewhere. So you define an alias, so four points to some parts. Or you can have Webpack to operate against custom extensions. So you might have like foo.jsx. So you, you still want to do import foo. So then you tell Webpack that let's support .jsx in extensions. So then you get uh, the .jsx support. That's a common pattern with React. You can also tell Webpack to look into specific models. So it doesn't have to look into node models only. It can look into other places for models. So this is essentially it's a hack layer. So sometimes you, ha you have packages you want to use and there's something wrong. Uh, so you can hack around a little bit. Uh, the interesting thing is that the same mechanism, it exists for loaders. So you can do resolve loader and against the uh, loader names. When this all goes together, you get Webpack configuration file. So you have the entry, par entry part, output module, plugins, and so on and so on. Yeah, I'll wait. Yeah. Uh, eventually, you, you get some output. So you get this bootstrap script, maybe 30 lines of code. It, begi it begins to execute the whole application. And finally, you have these models. So here, here we have model 0, 1, and so on. So we get this big bundle when we get started. Especially if you haven't used Webpack before, look into the output, read through the code, so you understand a little bit of what kind of loader it writes. Just to recap, Webpack has strict focus on bundling. So that's what it does best. So it gives us this transformation tool uh, that allows us to take the application and turn it into bundles. So it goes through the entire dependency graph of your application, including JavaScript files, uh, style files, images, whatever you might, ever might have. <laughs> and then it uses loaders and plugins uh, within this process. So the configuration is, is a declaration of how, how to do this. And you can also have inline definitions, which I'll discuss later, so you get code splitting. So if you have any questions related to basic ideas or basic concepts of Webpack, it's, it's a good time to ask. I can also go back to some slide and clarify if there's, there's something you didn't get. There's no same in asking. Yeah. Yep. What was the difference between a module and a plugin? Yeah, let's go back. So, module. So, mo module is, is a file. So, let's say we have like. Uh, do, do, do. So, here, these are modules. Okay. okay. It might be something else. It, it could point to CSS file and so on. But it, it, it's a good question because, I mean, if, if you don't understand the concepts, it's going to be a little tough. That's actually the main thing. I mean, people take some existing Webpack configuration. And then they complain that this doesn't work as I want because they don't understand. So if you understand the concepts, it makes sense.
but still, if you have more questions. Yep. How will it bundle CSS files? Sorry? How will it bundle uh, CSS files? So, how does Webpack bundle CSS files? Uh, I'll answer it later. <laughs> yes, because I have I have entire section for that. So, I, wa I don't want to spoil it. Yeah, I need, yeah. And it transforms your code in the order of you define the rules or the... Yeah, that's another, I, I don't want to spoil this because I have another se another section about this, so we can get back to that later. Yeah, so I guess we have to move on and look into developing with Webpack. So how to get started. So first, you might write this kind of line, so you give Webpack some file and you tell it to output here, but of course this is like the most stupid way to use Webpack because it doesn't do anything useful. You still miss the load fish and all that. So you need that configuration file we just discussed. Uh, but then you notice that, yeah, now I have these bundles, but uh, bundles alone, they don't do much. So next, what do you need is index.html. So you will write it by hand, but because loaders, uh, coders are lazy, they don't write the like to write these things by hand, so you can have a plugin that writes the index HTML for you. So this is where HTML Webpack plugin comes in. It writes the index HTML for you. And it writes the references to the bundles. It does a lot of things. Because it's so awesome, it has plugins for, so you have plugin plugins, correct? <laughs> uh, the most common way to use Webpack is to have package JSON, and then you have this script section. So you have different scripts for running Webpack in different ways. So you have like start for starting de development, of course, and then you have build and, and maybe test and staging and so on. But you get these little scripts and they tell Webpack to do li different things. It's valid to use Gulp or Grunt or whatever task runner you might want. But uh, for most people, it seems that package JSON is enough. But yeah, now, now you get this problem that now we have this bundles and we have index HTML and so on, but it's, it's not fun to develop because we still have the browser and we have to refresh the browser and build manually. So I guess the next step is to run Webpack in watch mode. So if you run Webpack in watch mode, it's going to compile everything. Uh, after each time, you make some change to your source. So anytime you make change, then it's going to compile. But we still have the problem that the browser doesn't do anything based on, on the result. So this is where Webpack Dev Server comes in. So this is a development server designed for this purpose. So you run Webpack Dev Server uh, and pass the configuration to it. And after that, you get refresh, refresh on your browser. So you do some coding, and the browser updates. But it's going to be hard refresh by default. So for that reason, we have Hotmail replacement, which means that uh, it can do software refresh. So it implements, or it provides this interface uh, that uh, allows you to patch models. So you can retain the application state while modifying the ap application after you implement, the a a implement HMR. I won't dig into that, but uh, it's something you can look up later. There's also techniques like linting JavaScript, because uh, <coughs> I could pick like two coders from here, and I bet you cannot agree on how to style JavaScript. So Anoka is on tabs and Anoka on spaces. Or we have two guys that there's one on, space, uh, on spaces that has like two spaces and then four spaces and different price prices and so on. So for that reason, it can be a good idea to have some kind of style guide, st style guide for code. And maybe you want to dissolve certain ways of using JavaScript or like push people to use certain patterns. It won't replace testing, but uh, I, think, I think it's essential with JavaScript at the moment. So first we got JSLint, that was really opinionated, then JSLint. Now we have ESLint, which seems to be the standard. I don't know what is the next tool, but we have ESLint at the moment. Uh, maybe the easiest way to get started is to get some, oops, get some ESLint config plugin going on. And I mean, this is the point is that you have some opinionated defaults here. So you pick something like Airbnb, and now you have like something really solid. You maybe have to disable a couple of rules, but you have to have your less of your own opinions when you use another, another, another person's opinions. So that's like, I, I like this, and it's quite used. <laughs> but you can 
integrate ESLint with the Webpack through ESLint Loader. So the point is, after you have this, and you enable overlay in VDS or WS, uh, you get overlay. So now you're coding happily, and then you make something stupid, and then your application blows up. So you might see something like this. So I made something stupid with indentation. I should fix. Another option would be to use uh, a plugin for your editor. That's actually what I do at the moment. But uh, that's like, you can get some nice output out of WS or this development server. And uh, after a while, you get this problem. Now you have multiple targets, uh, one for development, one for building, one for testing. You, st you start having a lot of configuration. And one way to do it is to have like separate configuration file for each target. But then you start having problems because you notice you have a lot of duplication. So you have a lot of like similar rules or across your configuration. So this becomes a problem. So how to manage all this? There are some ways. So people have written abstractions. So you have like tooling on top of Webpack configuration. Or the way I solved it was through composition. So I'll discuss composition next. Uh, in the next slide, but uh, after a while, you notice that maybe I can push this to package. So you have multiple projects, and you have all at the same problems. So you can push configuration to single package, which you can consume uh, across multiple projects. So maybe that's one way to manage complex configuration. But about composition, in the first book, I noticed that it's actually very difficult to explain Webpack or Webpack configuration because I, get, I got the duplication problem. So I, I noticed that if I write a little algorithm or little solution, I can actually solve the pain point. This is what I did with Webpack Merge. Uh, compared to normal Merge, it, it works a little differently. I think this is the main difference. So we have arrays, one, two, and instead of replacing, we concatenate. So we get array one, two, okay? And objects, they just work as you might expect. So letter B wins, and you get C and D. And as it happens, this is a very good fit with Webpack. And another, uh, if you use any configuration elsewhere, it actually makes a lot of sense there. So I, I mean, super simple idea, but uh, it actually saved me. Because then I can write this, so I can have common configuration and production configuration, network configuration, and a lot of configurations. I can compose this together. And finally, I can return uh, the configuration I want. So I pass an env or environment from Webpack, and then I compose again, and then I get something. I'll show you a more complex example. So this is actually from the book project. So in, in the book project, what I actually did, I wrote a little API between. So I have this high-level composition. So you see this parts dot something, and and this is the like the high-level view. About it's it's the manageable, so I can manage it. I can see what's going on. Yeah, it looks like a lot of code, but I mean I have this API in between because otherwise it would be like 500 lines of code. So this is my API for using Webpack. So this is something I control completely. My little abstraction, and this is something I can push to a package and I can start consuming it. But now I have like high-level abstraction and low-level abstraction and it's composable, and uh, I can do things I want. Uh, it's quite interesting uh, that, uh, I mean, I wrote it in 2015, the basic idea. It took a year to, for people to understand what I'm doing. Yeah, and then I, I got first users, and then more and more, and then it's, it's quite popular at the moment. And you notice the dip, you know why this dip exists, right? I mean, Coders don't work in Christmas. Yes, <laughs> yes, you, you can, yes. You can you can see it in every every popular package. So they just drop their computers and do something else. <laughs> just to recap, uh, Webpack provides ways to speed up your development flow. So especially Webpack to server is, is worth learning. I know the API is not perfect. There's a little plan to improve it, uh, and I hope we get it through. And you should link your code because it's just, uh, it doesn't cost a lot. Of course, if you have old project, it's, it sucks to implement ESLint on old project, but it might, might still be worth it. And it helps a lot in the environment. Uh, when it comes to configuration, consider composing. So if you can somehow push the commonalities for a little API you understand, it, it's good.
But if you have questions, uh, please. One question. No questions. Actually, yeah. yeah. Um, in that time, mer merge, um, what happened if um, you have a similar, the same plugin in two different configurations? Yes, yes, I got it. I got it. So, what happens if Webpack merge has two same plugins? At the moment, you get uh, two different plugins. Actually, try solving it. But the problem is that people can't write plugins using uh, prototypes and functions, and it, it's actually it, it's solvable, but it's a very ugly problem. I believe it will, the right way to fix it will be this. So instead of fixing Webpack merge, we should fix Webpack, and I'll show you how. So let's find some configuration problem up here. So like, uh, it's this new part I really don't like. So maybe we want to write plugins name, clean, blah, 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 options. Yeah. This could be like require instead. Yeah. So this is actually what I would like to write, because then you have something that composes. So that you can compose this, but you cannot compose new very easily. I mean, it's, it's doable, but it's stupid, so. So what happens right now? Is there a place that it? Yeah, yeah, yeah you, get, you get separate plugins. Uh, I know it's not the ideal, but I mean, uh, actually, I remembered something. There's actually more functionality. It's, I mean, the, what I actually saw this was the basic idea. Do, do, do. Oh, da, da, da. There's the merge and there's there's merge unique. I guess merge unique is actually what you might want. So it's a variant that does something what you actually wanted. I just remembered that actually there might be a function. Yeah, it's it's been, it has been so long time. But uh, yeah, there's there's more than just the basic thing. So it, it, just read through the API and see if it fits. Yeah, yeah, this is actually exactly what you want. Because we have a model replacement plugin, we want to make sure that it's only one, so. Yeah. yeah. Okay, second question. Yeah, so I guess you, you save questions for later, that's fine. So, but styling. So, someone asked about styling earlier. So, in, in Webpack, I guess this is the most common configuration you see. So you have a use style or CSS law, so you actually have to read it from right to left. So we first apply CSS law and style law. Uh, the logic why that happens is actually this. Do, do, do. Let's I'll just go. Oh. So we have style order or CSS law. It gets, oof, sorry. You see, now it makes perfect sense. So if you kind of imagine the string, or uh, I mean the array, as that like that, you see why it is what it is. So why it's from right to left when it comes to evaluation. Just remember that, and you you know. But yeah, uh, about this loader. So CSS loader, it it goes through imports. So you have these import statements and URL statements that can point to other files like CSS files and images, fonts, and so on. And you still want to apply some processing. So that's why we have CSS order in between. Also have style order. So it actually takes the output of CSS order and it writes a style tag uh, based on that. And it also implements ASMR. So if you have the development the server going on, uh, then you get these nice updates. So it's not going to refresh the whole application. Instead, style just gets applied. And if you need anything else, you can find loaders exactly for that. I think uh, post CSS loader is actually my favorite, so I can show it. Post CSS overall is, is amazing too, and I'll discuss a couple of plugins in, in a little bit. You can check it out. We're actually redos, uh, we're redoing the way Webpack does CSS at the moment, so this might look a little different in the future, but this is the current information. There's only one problem. Uh, if if you do it this way, uh, the CSS is actually going to your JavaScript. So you get JS file that's going to contain your JS code, and it's going to contain your style. And this is not nice. 
actually in, in production, you get this flash of unstyled content problem. So it's going to load the CSS only after the JS has been loaded. And that's something you don't probably want in production. So for this reason, I've had two solutions. Extract Text Webpack plugin. I hate the name because it's so long, but uh, uh, but uh, it, it's like the for number one solution. It's actually a plugin and a loader. So using loaders, you tell Webpack that it should uh, extract these specific CSS files. And the plugin performs the extraction. Uh, extract loader is a simpler alternative. So it's a lot, it's, it's just, uh, it's just Check out this board, understand those, and you can separate CSS into file of its own. There are techniques like auto -pre prefixing. This is what programmers like to write, but uh, we have these old browsers, so in practice you have to write something like this. And this is uh, what auto prefixing does for you. So if you have auto prefixer, it's going to write the code for you. So you, you take post CSS plugin, and uh, it's going to write. And how it does it, it actually takes a definition. So you have browsers list. So you tell it that I want to support popular browsers or last two versions of browsers or Internet Explorer 8. And based on this definition, it can generate the CSS you want. Especially this file is worth understanding. There's the solution process list package. It actually relies on can I use. So you have this can I use service. There's a database that gives the information. And browser's list, it's, it's able to use that information. And then there's tooling that relies on browser's list and is able to use that information to generate the code you actually need. It, it, it comes around in a lot of places. But yeah, that's about auto prefixing. Uh, then you might have this problem of like extra CSS. So let's say you are using, you have a static site. You're using Bootstrap, and uh, most likely you are not using each and every rule of Bootstrap. So you have unused rules. So based on static analysis, you can drop certain rules. So you actually get some complexity in dynamic sites. If you have application, then you have to do more work, but the idea is more or less the same. Two solutions, purify CSS and CSS. You can look up this later if you want to drop CSS that that's not being used. You can also lint CSS. Two solutions, style lint, CSS lint. Maybe one day this will become one tool, but we'll see. But again, you can see it's post CSS. So you have Webpack and post CSS and style lint, and then you get linting against CSS. Just recap, uh, if you want to look into styling, look, learn style loader and CSS loader. And then you have to learn to extract CSS, because otherwise it's going to end up in JS. And you have these separate techniques like auto fixing. And uh, there's the process list definition that's good to understand. Uh, then you have that unused CSS thing and linting. So any questions related to styling? Yeah. Um, you didn't say anything about CSS modules? No, because it's kind of advanced. It's in a book, but I kind of left it out. But I can man mention it. So let's see. I'll, I'll go through it really quickly. Because it's part of CSS modules. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yes, correct, correct. But I mean, the, I think the plan is to kick it out and push it into some, somewhere else. Oh, okay. So, like yeah, yeah, because it does too much. Yeah, now it make, makes sense. Yeah. But I can explain the basic idea of CSS models. So, the problem with CSS is, is that it's like uh, programming with globals. Like, nobody likes to program with globals, but CSS guys like. I don't know why. So for that reason, CSS models takes different approaches. It uh, solves the problem by going with local scope. So you have like a CSS file, and then you import the CSS file. It's globally, it's locally scoped. Note that the styles they are related to this file only, so they don't leak, and that actually solves the biggest annoyance of CSS. So now you have something nice and local, and it's very hard to break things. It's good for applications. Very simple idea, but it solves a really, really big pain. So, if you want to bundle your own CSS, then you use Workloader or there's something like that. I guess, I guess you have a CSS file, right? Yeah. And, and you just want to bundle it, uh, uh, you know, create a JavaScript module that exports those things. Mm. That's what 
Yeah, those are. Uh, just uh, can you repeat the early part? So what what do you actually want to bundle? So you have what? So you, you're talking about CSS. Right? Yes, correct. So. Yes, so the point is that we have like JavaScript model, JS model that points to CSS somehow. So we have import full full CSS, sorry, full CSS. And we, we want uh, JS bundle and we want CSS file. So this is where these solutions come in. So it allows you to perform this extraction that gives you the JS bundle and separate CSS. Okay, okay so, so it will go grab the, the row CSS and wrap in a JavaScript module? No, no, you, 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 no, no, you, you get like a normal J CSS file. So there's no JS around the CSS. Yeah. Yeah, so the question was that we have like big complex React application and each module points to CSS file. Uh, the question was about ordering. Uh, and in what order will these rules be the extracted CSS? So that's actually a little tricky question. Uh, my understanding is that it's, it's based on the order. It, it, uh, it finds the files. But it's, I mean, source is the answer. So it's, they can pick. There's, I know there's uh, this scary function somewhere about ordering. All right, all right. So, I mean, this is a very, very scary code. I mean, uh, we know it's a hack, and I hope one day it's not. So, there's a, there's a big scary function that describes the ordering, but uh, it's not it's not very easy to answer at the moment. So maybe we can do some research later, but uh, I don't know the answer at the moment. Yeah, but this is actually what CSS model solves. So if you have CSS models, then you don't have to really care about the order because. Yes, yes. But, but uh, uh, yeah. It's, it's partially true because it, it, like, it works unless you have this composition stuff. Mm -hmm. Because if you start composing in CSS modules, there's like this, this notion of composition is same to SAS. Ah, uh, yeah, because you can. Right. Yeah. When you start composing in CSS modules, you basically you run on this issue again. And I ran multiple times on it. It happens only when you start building in. For production, when you start composing these big CSS files, uh, yeah. and I think it's still unsolved. Yeah, I mean the uh, CSS models, the state. I mean it's it's processing too slow for my taste. I mean uh, it, I mean the, I think the idea is great, but uh, I think it's still it's still there are these annoying edge cases. But I mean, what can you do? Yeah, yeah. It's you know you have to go and fix yourself so because it's open source. So, any more questions? Yep. Usually you have to require style CSS in the JavaScript. Yeah, you, you can do that. Is there an alternative solution to just specify style sheet using the template configuration? You can, uh, one way to do it will be to have entry, and entry con contains an array of CSS files. <laughs> it, it kind of works, but I, I think the, the most common way is to have these JS models that point to CSS. I mean, I think I'll also show the other, other approach. Do do do. It's, it's somewhere. Do do do. Do do do. do. Yeah, do, yeah, I have like it's too big book, so it's going to take a while. But uh, it, I have it's somewhere in the end. entry. Ah, I'm just going to crap. Yes. Ah, I got it. <laughs> That's the wrong chapter. Yeah, this I think it's this one. So here I have like uh, I clocked the CSS files 
from the structure. I push them to entry, and after that, I have this style bundle. It's not neat, but yeah, it's, it kind of works. But this will allow you to separate the imports uh, and push them to one, one place, but uh, it kind of feels ugly. So I, I hope this helps a little bit. Yeah, maybe I'll fix it for the next version. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that might be the yeah. Because that's the whole point of using Webpack. Uh, yeah. To have explicit dependencies in your CSS. Yes, yes. Yeah, good point. I won't fix the book now, so I'll fix it later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I mean, this is why there's this fallback. So I mean, it's uh, this is actually a little complicated topic. So let's see. There's this fallback. The point here is that uh, we have like code splits, which I have not covered yet. But uh, you might want to use something for code splits. And in, uh, when you have a, a split point, it may make sense to inline the CSS in the split point. So instead of having a separate CSS file, you have JS file and you have the CSS inlined. So this is where fallback will come in. So you can use just a raw style order and it writes the, code, uh, the split bundle and it writes the JS and it writes the CSS. I don't know if this like answers your question. We can dig into it later, but I mean, it just pop into mind, so yeah. Yep. Um, I understand there's also an order for Seth. Yes. Um, is it possible to, to have um, Seth parcels, which means like a global variable class? So um, each of the parcels has access to the variable? Uh, I think I have seen this. I mean, this is about Seth and uh, global variables and access to those. Uh, my understanding is that this is a little tricky problem. I've seen it asked in the past. I don't remember like question out of the box, out of the box. But uh, it's something we can look into later today if we have a little time, because someone may may have solved it already. So, yep. I don't have like every, each and every answer, unfortunately. Sorry. Yeah, it's, it's a complicated world because there's some some guy uses. Dulus and less and sus and uh, post JSS and uh, I mean, yeah, but uh, I think we have to move on if we want to, you know, get to bits or something. Loading assets. I'll discuss uh, loaded definitions uh, a little bit. So the basic idea is that we have these conditions, so we match against something like files, JS files here. You can tell Webpack some restrictions. So you tell it that we should apply these actions only if these restrictions <laughs> apply. So we can uh, do like the Webpack to include, uh, do operations against our application only, uh, instead of like files that are outside of it. Th 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 this uh, not both bit. So we, maybe we don't want to perform, say yes, I mean, not Babel uh, against uh, JS files, because it doesn't make sense uh, to apply Babel, Babel for those files. But this is just uh, like the basic idea. So we have conditions, restrictions, actions. But evaluation order. So you have, we saw this earlier. So we had this use so and CSS low style order. So from right to left, but also from bottom to top, top. So you have to start from bottom and go to top. So these two are equal. When it comes to plugin, it's actually from top to bottom. So first plugin wins, so you get first hooks from the top to bottom. So it's a little different there. Uh, sometimes it's beneficial to be able to tell a loader that you should execute first. Uh, this is good for linting. So you have, we want to apply linting rule and don't want to care about where to put the linting rule. So you, you tell of pre. So now it's going to happen before anything else. There's also post. I have seen maybe thousand configurations. Nobody has ever used post. So maybe it's not useful. Also have inline definitions. So you can apply additional processing against specific files. So here we apply some loader, and then we go to configuration and apply the rest. Uh, if you don't want to do that, you can ap apply this, uh, this uh, exclamation marks 
and now it's going to uh, stop executing. So it's, it's going to perform the loader, and that's it. But uh, I mean, you can see sometimes you see these definitions, but maybe you should not use them too much. You can also do tricks like this in Webpack 2. So here I implemented uh, this uh, resource query based matching. So I, I apply inline or external, and I, I do different things thing based on what, what's in the end. So I, in this case, I apply URL, URL order. Here I apply file order. So I can do this kind of partial matches. Or I can perform uh, or apply loader based on context. So in this case, I'm going to apply style order only if uh, CSS is imported within JS file. So there are cool features like this in Webpack 2. But I have a couple of ideas related to images and fonts next. So there's, uh, there's some basic decisions to make. In HTTP 1.1, you have this problem that the uh, is request comes with overhead. So if, if you have a lot of requests, it's going to slow down your app. So let's say you have tons of small images, it's going to be a problem. Uh, there are at least two ways to solve this. So you can take these small images, you can write the sprite. So you write the big image, and you write the sprite map that gives uh, mapping information to sprite. So now you have big image to load, no problem. Or what you can do is to take these small, this small images, and you can inline them into JavaScript. So you get this JS bundle that contains JS code, and it contains the images. So URL loader actually does this. So it, it's able to inline images as base64 in your JS bundle. And you can also give it limit. So you can tell it that we should inline only, uh, only as long as we are below this limit. If we go above, we can, it's going to use file order. So file order is going to emit files and give parts. So this is the, another option. You can also find something related to optimization, writing source sets, and so on and so on. Fonts, it's the same problem. So you have the same loaders, same problems. And you can also find more loaders that are specific to fonts. JS, this is interesting. Because in Webpack 2, we have support for ES6 models. So Webpack is going to process your ES6 models, but it's not going to touch anything else. So this means that uh, you get problems with old browsers. Because now you have these ES6 features in your code, and you pass it to old browser, and the browser is going to die. So for that reason, you have to apply some extra processing. And this is where paper loader and paper process env come in. I want, to, I want to discuss this later a little bit more. So the point is that uh, we have browser definition again. So we tell that we want to support these browsers. And based on this, uh, this preset is able to write code that's going to work in the browsers. It's also going to write sims. So the cool thing is that as we get newer and newer browsers, it has to write less and less code. But also this means that ES6 features go through, and that, that's a good thing. It, it's a problematic with minification, but I'll discuss that in the next presentation. So yeah, it's the browser definition idea again. Okay. With loaders, you get the conditions in the beginning, possible restrictions, and final actions. And you have a lot of functionality that allows you to customize the behavior, and those specific fields and all that. And when it comes to assets, you have to do decisions uh, like, do I want to inline or not? And do I want to optimize through Webpack and so on? And uh, if you have ES6, maybe you want to use Babel. <laughs> of course, one option will be to skip JavaScript and use TypeScript or some hipster language. But uh, it's like whatever you want to do. But if you have questions, please. Yep. Um, does Babel also respect the browser lists? Yeah, that, that's actually the same definition. But the problem is that there is a bug that uh, makes it impossible to use the file. So it, it's, not, it's not going to pick up the file yet, but it's, internally it's going to use the same definition. So it, now my understanding is that you have to write the same definition twice, once in Babel configuration and once into the file. And it's a little stupid, so I have to fix it. It's not supported using the package. I have to look that up, because if it does, it, uh, it's just awesome. So, but it's the same idea. So. But uh, my understanding it is that if you have a browser's list file, it's not going to pick it up yet. Mm. 
Yeah, it's silent, so I guess I have to move on, yeah, okay? So, building. So, now you have transformed code, and uh, the problem is that it's not the most fun thing to debug. So this is where source maps come in. So you write source maps to make it easier for you to, to, so, uh, to debug the code, because the source map gives, the, it gives uh, mapping from the original source to transformed source. Two, two options, so inline source maps, it's going to write a big bundle that's going to contain the code and it's going to contain a map. Good for development. So these are going to the bundles and there's a fast read bundle and so on. But uh, it's not cool for production <laughs> because now you have big bundles and nobody likes big bundles in production. So that's, for, that's why you have to use separate source maps in production. So you write uh, app.js that contains reference to separate mapping file and then you have source maps in production. Yep, and uh, the problem, of course, is that it's, it's a little slow to generate, but it's either for production. But as you notice, this behind this field, dev tool, dev tool something. You can also find two plugins. I don't know if anybody actually uses the plugins, but they exist if you want to try them. But now we get to the like to the features that make Webpack Webpack. So first feature is bundle splitting. So the thing is that maybe you have this big bundle, let's say app.js. But uh, it's not very cool because as you update it, the client has to download it again and again. So maybe it's, uh, maybe the first step is to split it up a little bit. So maybe we want one bundle for application logic, one bundle for vendors. So we have these dependencies in one and our own logic in one. And the point is, that if you do this right, the client has to download only one of these as we make changes. So application code changes, only application bundle has to be loaded, downloaded again and so on. So first step, separate into two. And second step, apply hashes based on some small factor. Uh, so we get this, uh, I mean, uh, good hashing behavior. And uh, in Webpack, there's one plugin, common stunk plugin. I think it's the scariest plugin in Webpack because it's like 10 options, very difficult to use. So one technique that uh, achieves exactly this. But you have a lot more. You have like accuracy splitting plugin, which is useful with HTTP2. So you get these little bundles as you want. Yep. Yep. So about the idea. So this is what we want. We want app bundle and vendor bundle. How to tell this apart? Uh, one easy way is to do it so that uh, vendor bundles, or this vendor bundle, these are, this, this will be within node modules. So node modules contains our dependencies, of course, and they are JS files. So two conditions to check. And to do this, we can, we write it that, yeah, it's, it's the vendor bundle, okay? And uh, we want to uh, do perform a check. So there's min chunks option. And in min chunks, we check that, yeah, it's in node modules. So Webpack goes through the graph, and it, it runs this check against each resource. So we do this check, and we check that it's in, in, it's in the node modules directory, and it's a JS file. So yeah, it's a vendor. So this gives us the bundle we want. There's another technique. This is lower level technique. So it's good to note that the bundle split technique is, is configuration level. But code splitting, it's a lower level technique. So these splits, they belong to the application code itself. So the point is that let's say you have a big application and you have some expensive view. And on the expensive view, you have like chart component that weighs like 500 kilos. And you probably don't want to load, download the 500 kilos uh, on, in your vendor bundle or instantly or whatever. So you want that heavy dependency only as you need it. And that's actually what we can do with code splitting. So we write a split point, and in split point we get the dependency we need. And after that we have solved the problem because now we get uh, code as we need it. And the way it works is that we write a little piece of code, import, uh, import returns, import points to some model, and it's, it, it returns a promise. So we get this promise, and in promise we get the model, and now we can do our thing. Or if the network is down, maybe it's going to crash and we get error. A uh, while ago, we added a new feature. So we can name these imports. So if, if you have multiple splits and you give them the same name, 
it's going to generate one bundle that's going to contain all functionality. So you can pick up like multiple separate split points and put them into one. And because it's promise based, you can apply your promise skills. So you can do promise all, so we get uh, some library and we get some search index. And after we have this, we can perform a search. Output is going to write a little bundle that's going to contain this wrapper and the models. And on, on the consuming side, there's a piece of promise that the prefers the loading. This is the older syntax, so, so you, in older code you can see record answer uh, roughly equivalent to what you saw earlier. Uh, because it's not fun just to make builds, it's good to be aware of sort of plugins. So this are actually go go to what, like it, they're more like tasks where people have written this. So we we have this like clean webpack plugin. It's going to clean the output directory, or you can write additional information about the build to the build file. So you get like version and uh, git has and so on. So you look you have these files in production, and by looking into file you can tell which version it is. For in, for instance, you can also find copy plugin, but you maybe you know CPR, so maybe you don't need it, but it's good to know. Uh, to recap, uh, like first step to improve the development flow is to write source maps. Dev tool something. Uh, you can do this bundle splitting and get into caching. Uh, I'll explain this in, in more detail in the second presentation, so you get the full idea. And you can load functionality as you need it if you use code splitting. So you can write this import promise bits. And you can tidy up the build to avoid confusion and just have better result. So if you have questions related to this or the whole presentation, please. Can you show how to, do you have an example how to do code splitting? Yes. With, uh, stuff? Ah, so. Because I think it's, that's the tricky part. All right, all right. So, so you can have like this and this at the same point, right? I mean, uh, same time. let me think. So what? What you actually want? So you so want? I want to put like I want to have a vendor chunk, mm? like two bundles. Where, so I want to use a common chunk plugin mm? to split like my application code and vendor code. But I still want to use code splitting. And, and, and when I use code splitting, I still want to, like vendor vendor parts going. Into Okay, so how to combine these two ideas? Yeah, I don't see them as like mutually exclusive. I see them as like uh, like uh, you can you can have like this high level split. I mean, separ I mean the vendor part all that and code splits. And if you have code splits, uh, I guess the question is uh, if you have a split that points to some library. And you have the high level configuration, I mean the bundle splitting. Is it going to pick up the library in, the, in bundle splitting setup? Right, right. Uh, I don't think so. Because if, if you have, I mean, ah, but the, the, there's, the, there's the trick. Because you can, on, on application level, you can actually have import my library. And then you can have, have code split that have, has the same import. So I guess that's the problem. That's actually a little difficult. So I think I have to study that and get back to you, back to this question later. Because it's, let's, it's, let's discuss this because this is kind of an unsolved problem for me. Yep. At this time point, so what I would like to have is that this thing does, does this automatically. So kind of a pre preset that like splits automatically, but but when I have code splitting, it also like works. Yeah, but uh, we can spend some time after presentation because now I understand the problem and then we can figure out maybe solution. So, so any more? So how do I, sorry. How do you integrate AOD with the pack? How do I integrate? AOD. Audi, Audi, ah, Audi, Audi. Uh, I, I don't know, I don't know. Audi, you mean the Angular, Audi. Sorry. Out of time, out of time. Hmm. Let's get back, back to the data. I, I, I need more information, sorry.
I, I had of time. I, I got a great story, so I had I had wrong story. So, so. I had of time. Uh, I don't know yet, so I don't have to answer. So I think we, this is something we have to look into after press this. Yeah, there, there might be plugin. Yeah, yeah, there's just plugin for everything. So I, 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 I don't know AOT enough to. They have some cookbook that there's something about AOT, but the problem is I don't use AOT myself, so I don't know the answer. But yeah, most likely there's plugin you can use. I hope. <laughs> Yes, sir. Yeah, so I guess maybe it's time to take a 10 minute break. Let's, so let's take a break. We yeah. still have three beers. Uh, let's get back in 10 minutes. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, thanks.